Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our Lunchtime Webinar Express series. Today, we'll be hearing from award-winning marketer Edna Boampong on the success of the Getting Under the Skin project. So before we get started with Edna's presentation, let's very quickly go over the format for today's session and how you can participate in the live Q&A. We'll be hearing from Edna for around 30 to 35 minutes. We'll then move into a 10 to 15 minute Q&A session to answer some of your questions. For those of you registered for the webinar and viewing on the GoToWebinar platform, you'll be able to post your questions for the Q&A at any time during the session by clicking on the question mark you'll see on your screen. If you're watching on a laptop, you'll find the question mark on the right-hand side of your screen or along the top or bottom if watching on a tablet or smartphone. If you're watching us live on YouTube or Facebook and would like to take part in the Q&As in future webinars, you'll need to register for the session either via the CIM events page or through our posts on the usual social channels and watch it via the GoToWebinar app to be able to submit questions. Edna has very kindly agreed for the slides to be available to download whilst we're broadcasting. So if you'd like to have a copy, just click on the handouts icon and you'll find them in there. Again, this feature is only available if you've registered for the session and are watching via the GoToWebinar app. If you would like to share your thoughts about today's webinar on the socials, you can use the hashtag CIM events. We'll pop the hashtag up again a little later when we get to the Q&A. If you're a university student attending today's webinar, then you may want to sign up to the CIM Marketing Club. All you need to do is hover your camera over the QR code and that will take you straight through to the sign up page. Alternatively, you can hop onto our website and find it within the qualifications drop down menu. It'll keep you up to date with the latest trends, innovations and concepts in the marketing industry. So it really is worth taking a look and signing up. So I would now like to introduce our guest speaker, Edna Boampong. If you want to turn your webcam on, Edna, I'll pass things over to you and the floor is yours. Thank you, Judith. Um, and welcome. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, I'm delighted to be here. When I say here, I'm just at home, but I'm delighted to be hosting this webinar for you. So before I get started, um, I'm just want wanting to do a bit of a poll because I can see, and the numbers are still piling in, um, there are there are almost 400 people on this uh, who, are, who are online at the moment, and I can't see anyone, and I don't know who who people are, but it would be really good if I if you could just pop up the poll, please, um, Liz, so we can just get an idea of where people are coming from. Now, I've been told that. This could be international. There could be people from where, where all over the world, or it might just be people from the UK. So I'm just interested to know. Now, this was a tricky one when I was trying to think about what were the options that people could select from. Um, I thought to do it by continent, but that didn't quite work. So I only had five options. But hopefully, there is an option here that matches where you're from. And whilst you're doing that, because I know it takes a few moments for um, people to be able to select and for the results to come up, just to give you a quick view of who I am, um, I'm Edna Bonepong. I am currently the Director of Communications for Shropshire um, NHS. I, my background essentially is in public health and social marketing. So I would say as a communication person I'm an insight-led communicator and use that really in in the work so along with some of the other communications marketing engagement type responsibilities I have within the NHS in Shropshire so whilst we're still waiting for the results to come up I think it's probably worth saying if people have attended this webinar to hear a really theory-based talk about behavioral science or if you're expecting me to talk you through the behavior change wheel etc cetera, etc cetera, i'm really sorry to disappoint you that's not what this presentation is going to be about the presentation is about trying to put in a simple way powerful insight can be um and how powerful it is to use research when you're using when you are communicating or trying to target people and showcase um just what kind of impact you can have by using research and insight okay that's interesting um it says expected to a certain extent i expected most people to be coming from uk and europe but we also have some people that are from africa and asia and from either america or the caribbean so hello everyone we have actually gone 
international. Brilliant. Okay, back to my slides. So I'm going to start with um, my with a question. What is behaviour change? Okay, behaviour change is as what it says on the tin. Behaviour change is try is the practice of trying to change people's behaviour. Right, that seems quite simple, doesn't it? Now I'm going to go a little bit old school here because this is where I started. I started in social marketing and social marketing was what I would describe the, the OG, the original um, for when we started to talk about behavior change and we use social marketing, particularly in health and health related social marketing essentially is this systematic application of marketing alongside other concepts and techniques with the idea of changing behaviours and reducing inequalities. So for me, what this is, it's about using some of the well-established marketing techniques that the commercial world has always used to change behaviour, to improve, um, to reduce inequalities. And we've seen over the years that social marketing has been a really powerful and useful tool in actually changing behaviour and sustaining um, and behavior change in a really cost effective way. Now, I know some years ago we started moving away from the terms, especially in the health arena. And that was mainly because there was a misconception about social marketing and what it meant. And people kept referring to it as a as a bit of a gimmick or more just um, marketing. So to be really clear in terms of what social marketing includes, and some people may be familiar with this social marketing is it focuses on social goals it's all about having a really deep understanding of people's beliefs lifestyles a real key thing about social marketing is about segmentation it's about understanding that one size doesn't fit all and i'll talk to you a little bit about that in a moment but segmenting audiences is the way to be really targeted as i said before the focus of social marketing is always usually around behavior change. Social marketing, marketing focuses on an understanding of barriers to action as well as competitive behaviors. And I'll explain that again in a moment. An important part about social marketing is the use of mixes, a mix of strategies and interventions and channels, because as I mentioned, it's about segmenting people. And ensuring that you're not you are doing the right thing or saying the right thing using the right channel to the right people at the right time so you need to have a full marketing mix another important element of social marketing is collaboration it's about working on this with a range of people because you just get a, a better result and lastly something that in some ways is core to social marketing but sometimes is forgotten it's about people that you're trying to engage with working with them, engaging them in the creation and the delivery of what you are trying to achieve. So it's about that that co-design piece. Now, before I go on, I will make the uh, I will apologize, because if I do use if I do slip too much into NHS speech, I will kind of try and rein myself in and talk in plain language. But us people in the NHS do have a tendency to talk a little bit in um, in acronyms and riddles. So at the core of any behavior change program or social marketing is the person understanding the person and understanding the behavior so whether that is if you come from my world the 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 people being communities um patients citizens but in a commercial world it's it's the same thing it's your customers and your consumers and your clients for instance equally the behavior is about what people um, actually do so understanding and looking at what people do examining why they do it what's the influencers or influences and what are those incentives and barriers now I'm as I say of coming at this from a very sort of NHS kind of health perspective but it's the same for anything so if you are from the commercial world if you want to change if you want someone to buy some of your products versus a competitor's product that in some ways understanding who they that person is those people are and who your consumers are and understanding what drives them what incentivizes them 
might then help you to understand how can you get them to change their buying and change their buying habits. So all of this, from my perspective, is means that you have to start with a realistic understanding of how and why people behave the way that they do. Traditional attempts to influence the way people act are often based on communications and raising awareness and, and quite often assumptions. And we do that quite a lot in the NHS. We we are trying to get people, we're trying to encourage people to change their behaviour, but really it's not a behaviour change campaign, it's a communications campaign or raising awareness. There's one important aspect of behaviour change. And what it is, is uh, the, that important aspect is acknowledging that majority of people, they know, knowing what they should do and knowing um, and doing it are not always the same thing. And that's coming back. That's coming back to what I talked about, that sort of preferred behaviour um, versus competitive behaviour. So this is a this is a, a behavior analysis that I often do when I'm starting any type of communication type um, program. And I've got an example here where I've done um, a bit of a behavior analysis for cycling versus using a car. So on the left, you've got what is the preferred behavior? The preferred behavior is for to try and encourage cycling. And on the right, is the competitive behavior, which is the use in a car. So as you can see, there are, most people understand some of what the preferred, why, why do I want to, why, why is it a good idea to cycle? Things like it's good exercise, it makes me feel good, et cetera, et cetera. But on the other hand, there is the things that stop you from cycling uh, or person from cycling, it's quicker, it's easier, et cetera. And then what sits underneath that are some of the barriers. So. What I've tried to highlight here is there are some very obvious things that we might all be able to guess if if we were looking, if we were doing a bit of a behaviour analysis on why someone cycles versus using a car. But actually what I've highlighted is a few things in red that are things that maybe we just wouldn't know unless we spoke to people to understand why it is that people are not changing their behaviour. So, for instance, someone might not be cycling for not concerned about their own health, but they know that it's their family members that might worry about them being on the road. Or it could be some really functional issues, like they don't, they just don't know how to choose the right bike. So I know a lot of cities are putting a lot of effort into building the infrastructure to encourage people to cycle. But actually the infrastructure alone is not what's going to change behavior. They need to think about understanding what might motivate a person to actually decide to cycle or not. Now, this is this is really a kind of a quick and dirty way of doing some kind of primary research or a bit get to get a bit of understanding from about people. And what I would say, if you take one thing away from this session, it's it's this. So every time you are about to do some kind of campaign or comms type program to try and encourage people to do is do something to, to change their behavior or act in a certain way. Either do this yourself to kind of just think through what people, what are the benefits, what are the barriers, or do some real quick and dirty research with some of those people that you're trying to target and ask them these questions. And you never know, you might get some really important insight that's going to help you actually structure your campaign or your messaging that actually you may not have thought of. So, Social marketing, it's a whole process. It's important to prepare. It's really important to understand what the problem is. What is the exam question you're trying to answer? Gaining consumer insight is really key. Understanding who you're trying to engage with. What are those barriers? What are those concerns? What are the incentives? What motivates the person? Developing the strategy, implementing, and then reviewing. And actually, sometimes when you do the review, you might have to cycle back a few of those steps and go back to getting a bit more insight and then actually tweaking your strategy depending on what people have told you. But what are the benefits of taking a social marketing approach? So 
before we talk about the benefits, because I'm 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 bound to talk about the benefits, aren't I? Because I'm this is what I live and breathe and this is what I believe in. But I can also recognize what some of the drawbacks are. Some of the drawbacks of taking a social marketing or an insight led approach is the fact that it is more expensive quite often doing research you might not have the skills and expertise internally to do some of the research and you need to outsource it um and it is a lot it does take longer to take an approach where you are gaining insight you are testing your what people have told you you are testing your materials testing your messages it does take a bit longer but if you do it it will be more effective and you'll get better results it will give you taking a social marketing approach will, will give you a better idea of who to target. It will give you a better idea of why people act in a certain way and how to how to change and um, what behavior you need to influence and how to go about doing it. So I'm now going to talk you through a case study that takes that approach that I've just talked about. Now, I appreciate that. Um, that was a really quick whistle top store, um, tour on social marketing. And, and this is going to be a bit of a, a run, a canter through this. I mean, I could talk for hours about this case study because it was delightful actually working on this and delightful seeing the results. Um, and the point of me going taking you through this case study is not to necessarily share all of the data with you because there's a lot of data. I'll share snippets of it, but I will at the end say if you want to kind of get more more of the, the the whole all of this data, all of the research that we did, I'd be happy to share that. But for now, this is just about giving you an example and a flavour of the approach we took, what we found out, and then how we developed our campaign and the results that we got from it. So this program of work was done around two years ago um, in across Cheshire and Merseyside, which is a conurbation of about three million people and nine local authority areas. The context of this, which people might be aware this was take this campaign or this piece of work started when we were about six months into the pandemic and we were noticing COVID-19 was not affecting all population groups in the same way. We knew people that were older was, were dying at a higher rate. P males, for some reason, were people living in areas of deprivation and people from ethnic minorities were dying at a higher rate. Now, most of that correlated with existing inequalities and mortality rates that we see every year. The outlier for us was ethnic minorities. We couldn't understand why people from ethnic minorities were, were dying at a higher rate. And it was concerning because we knew that that would be widening that inequality gap. So I'm, 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 I'm going to talk through the purpose of this program. But I'm going to start with quite from a quite a personal point of view. This is Mary Ajapong. Mary Ajapong uh, was 28 years old during the height of the pandemic and she was pregnant. This was um, in the first round of the pandemic really early on. She was a nurse um, and she was quite late on in her pregnancy and at the time there wasn't the advice to for pregnant women to discontinue working. So she continued working while she was pregnant. And partly she continued working was because she couldn't afford to not work because she was the main breadwinner. She had a younger um, she had a younger child at home and a husband. She was a main breadwinner. So she couldn't really protect, afford to protect her and her unborn child. Mary caught COVID during work and unfortunately she died during childbirth. Mary was a friend of my mum's. She attended the same church as my mum. And when she died, my mum and the church community, it rocked them. They were they were full of fear. Um, they were absolutely devastated at what at this happening to someone so young who was full of life that left the young child and her, her husband behind. But um, but thankfully the baby survived. And whilst I was seeing this playing out and seeing how um, this was affecting my mum and other members in my family and the community generally, I just wondered what was the NHS doing to respond to this? How were we going to ensure 
that we could support people from ethnic minorities going forward. We know that uh, we knew that people from ethnic minorities often access our services at a lower rate than people from um, from different backgrounds. But we knew that that inequality gap was going to keep widening. So if we were really going to close that gap and ensure that we could put in some recovery mechanisms to support people from ethnic minorities, we needed to gain a better understanding of things that were um, impacting them with COVID generally. On top of that, we were working on the COVID vaccine. And anecdotally, I had heard, I knew that people from, I knew my community, the African community, were very hesitant. They were saying that they did not trust this vaccine and when it came, they were not going to take it. And as someone working in healthcare, that was a bit of a concern to me because I knew that those groups were people that, that really needed it. So I worked really hard um, to get the funding to, 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 to deliver this program because I realised that in order to actually really support people from ethnic minorities and potentially lead to run a COVID camp a campaign to encourage people to take the vaccine, we needed to understand a little bit more about them. So this was a three stage approach in terms of um, the research. We started with a, a real good understanding of who, pe who, who they were and I'll come back to and talk to you talk to you in detail about these all of these three processes we did some desk research to start off with and then we did some quantitative research to understand the what and then we did the some qualitative research to understand the why and how we could help people so in terms, this is a bit of a busy slide, and again, I don't ex expect people to be able to read it or understand all of it. But what this is trying to tell us, what this is trying to say, and the ver at the very first instant, I was saying to the powers that be, okay, can you give me a really accurate understanding of the, the mix of ethnic minorities across the whole of Cheshire and Merseyside, across the nine local authorities? And what people kept saying is, the most up-to-date data we've got is the census data. The census data was about 10 years too old, uh, out of date. And we knew that there was transient populations and the, the population had really changed over 10 years. So what we did was we, I worked with a data mining company that looked at um, mining lots of, getting lots of different data from, um, from schools data to all sorts of other data that would give us a clearer picture of who lived where across our 10 local, nine local authorities. We then built a tool, this interactive tool that enabled us to drill down by street level who lived on particular streets across the whole of um, Cheshire and Merseyside. So what this was telling us was by street, what the mix of ethnic minorities were on that street. We, able, we were able to layer it with additional other um, um, data like the indices of multiple, multiple deprivation which tells you how deprived or affluent an area is and we're able to be able to tell and really segment different people by street level that is really powerful we didn't have that data anywhere the next thing we did was we needed to kind of understand we needed to ask, we needed to reach out to people and understand and ask people and get people to engage with a questionnaire. Now let's remember, this was during lockdown. So I believe we started doing this work during the second phase of lockdown. So most of this was having to be done online or telephone. And we were, we were having to target, we wanted to target every ethnicity group across Cheshire and Merseyside. And according to the census data, there's about 16 ethnicity groups. And we wanted to try and speak to as many people as possible and ask them a range of questions, um, as well as, their, how they felt about the COVID-19 vaccine, but also other things about how it was, in, how COVID was impacting them. So we used a range of different mechanisms to reach out of them, reach out to them. Partly was a social media campaign. And we used this tool that I just spoke about that we built in, in the first phase to really do some geo-targeted um, social marketing, where we actually used we, we created a number of different adverts and targeted them at certain postcodes that we knew people from those backgrounds and ethnicities lived. So it was a highly targeted program just to get people to actually fill out our research. 
And here is some of the insight. Here is some of what we found out from people in the first phase. And as I say, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but I'm going to give you a bit of a flavour. First of all, the first bit of insight was the acceptance of, of the vaccine varied by ethnicity group. So what we were hearing initially was that, um, and this was really timely because this piece of research, we were just finishing it at the time of the first rollout of the vaccination. And what we were finding was our research and what it was telling us was pretty much mirroring uptake figures. So for instance, we, the first of all people thought that every, all ethnic minorities would be hesitant. But actually what we found out was that the, there was it really differed between the different ethnic ethnic minority groups and there were about there were about eight ethnic minority groups in particular that we would class as hesitant that would go either way but there was there were other ethnicity groups like um people from the gypsy um gypsy traveler background and people that describe themselves as black other or people that describe describe themselves as white and black african mixed and also Irish people who were outright rejectors of it. So you can see here, there was a real mix on, on terms of where people said they would definitely take the vaccine or not. And this was really insightful for us because what we found was that there was about 20% of people that said they were hesitant. So that was what we would class as they could go either way. But there was 13% of people from ethnic minorities that rejected it altogether and said, no, I would definitely not take it. So for us, we felt that the hesitant group were the group where were A were the biggest group who were sitting on the fence, and they were also the group that we could probably have most influence over. Really, another really interesting fact was that trust in the NHS was much higher than the government. Now, people might say, well, actually, that's that's quite obvious. We we knew that. But actually, we knew that a lot of the messages that were coming out about COVID were quite often from local government and central government. And what we found out was actually people did not necessarily trust local government or um, um, national government, but actually the trust in the NHS is quite high. And you can see here, what we were able to do is categorise people into three different categories, though, the people that were acceptors, the, the people that were hesitant, people in the middle, and the rejectors. Um, and we were asking them questions about what do you, what official sources of the COVID-19 do you actually believe? And what you'll see here is that even people that would class themselves as um, um, who were rejectors, they had much more higher trust in the NHS and the NHS messaging than they did in um, the local authorities, local authorities and national government. And that was really quite insightful for us because that helped us understand well, what voice do we speak to? What, what, how do we brand things? Um, and how do we, we, we now recognised what people, what institution people were more likely to resonate with. The other thing that was quite insightful that people that we found out through this research was that um, how effective the vaccine was 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 the, one of the principal barriers to take up um, to take up the vaccine, but there were other things that people were concerned about as well. So the biggest concern was people saying that they didn't think it was going to work very well, but also people were really concerned about things like leaving the house to, to get the vaccine and catching the vaccine. That was a real concern to people. And what was interesting actually is that different ethnic minorities had different concerns about why they would take the vaccine or not. So it was, again, remember I said earlier about why segmenting your audience is so important. That was one of the reasons, because we were able to see what were the things that were concerning and what were the barriers for the different groups and different ethnic minorities. And it also differed by age. People of different ages had different issues around why they did or didn't want to take the vaccine. So you can see here that about 29% of people um, had concerns about actually catching the vaccine when they left, um, catching the vaccine whilst trying to get, catching the, the, the disease whilst they were going to get the vaccine, but also not trusting the government featured quite high and also other functional things like transport features quite high. 
The other thing of interest was different ethnicities trusted different media sources. Now, this is a really busy um, um, sort of slide and I don't expect people to really understand this. Or, but what I want to take away from this, again, which is important when you are looking at doing a comms campaign, is we asked the question about what media they, they use the most and what sources that they trusted. And as you can see here, on balance, people from mixed ethnicity groups had lower trust ratings. They trusted less things than other groups. Um, people from Asian responders trusted things like UK TV um, more than other ethnicity groups. Um, and black and uh, Asian and black communities were more likely to trust things like newspapers, community publications and publications that came through the door. Now, again, when building your kind of communication strategy, this was really important to understand. Um, what I've told you previously is understand what some of those concerns were for the different um, ethnic minority groups. And then what were the trusted medias? What were the what were the sources that they trusted the most and used the most? So it would help us kind of have that cut through more. So. That was the quantitative research that told us the what. And as I mentioned to you before, that an important part of this of the or the third part of this program was then doing the qualitative research. So what we did was we we held about 10 focus groups with a mix of different ages and genders um, from across the nine local authority regions. We then had 10 in-depth telephone interviews with key stakeholders, community figures. And what we wanted to do through the focus groups and through the telephone interviews was just test some of our findings with people, get a bit more and get a bit more meat on the bone, find out a little bit more about why people were saying the things they were saying. And and also find out what were some of the mitigations we could put in place? What were the things that we could do to improve communications and interventions? How, what did we need to do to support people to actually either trust us or change their behavior around either accessing services or um, taking the COVID-19 vaccination? Again, this is a busy slide. I don't expect you to be able to read all of this or digest it, but what I wanted to share with you is, again, this was really insightful for us. So I mentioned before that we, in the first phase of the quantitative research, we were able to almost segment our audiences into three categories, which was the acceptors, the hesitants, and then rejectors. Through the qualitative research, we were able to segment audiences even more. So we were able to segment people into five categories. So what we had in the acceptors sort of, um, column was people that were enthusiastic, so eagerly awaiting. They, as soon as the vaccine came, they were going to take it. We had people that were open minded, um, every intention of taking the vaccine, but we're going to just wait and see. Um, and then you had the hesitants, who were the people in the middle that were saying they could tip either way. They would consider it, but they, they needed a bit more information and need to be convinced a bit more. And then over to the rejectors, you had people who were, we called the fatalist, who were avoiding the vaccine um, and they just were not convinced about the vaccine at all. And then you also had the people that were mistrusting. Not only were they were they um, avoiding the vaccine, but they also had a number of horror stories. They thought that the vaccine was being offered to them on the count of racism. They, they just completely didn't believe that the government had their best interests at heart. So there was absolutely no way that they could be convinced. Doing a qualitative research, we were able to understand, as I say, to segment people further, understand where they were coming from a little bit more. We were able to categorise them people further to understand which ethnicity groups fitted into each of those categories. And we were also able to understand who were the what was the best route to market in terms of influencers. So which people might, if we were going to be uh, trying to target these people, who, who did the message need to come from? So I know I'm going to, I'm, I'm now running short of time and then say I could speak for hours on this. So I'm not going to talk too much about this chart. But what this tells you is from the qualitative research, what we found was it, there was almost four headings. 
I think the trust piece is a really important piece thing that I just wanted to just touch on a little bit. There were a lot of people from and, um, um, ethnic minorities that were labelled anti-vaxxers because they didn't want the vaccine. One of the things that we needed to acknowledge through this programme was that some of people from ethnic minorities had really legitimate reasons for why they did not want to take the vaccine. Some of it came from fear, some of it came from concerns around their experience in healthcare, and some of it came from ex concerns around what they'd seen happen in their home countries in Africa, where um, certain pharmaceutical companies had potentially come and experimented in third world countries. So it did really come from a position of fear. So, and also some of it came from concerns about feeling disenfranchised, feeling like the government have never put their interests at um, their interests first. So all of a sudden, this experimental drug has come out and they're saying, roll up, roll up, come and get the vaccine, people from ethnic minorities. This is what you need. You can see why some people were a bit dubious and didn't necessarily trust. So one of the things that was core to this programme was building trust. And this isn't just for this programme, this is into the future. We need to build trust within those communities. So they do. So when we so when things like this happen again, there is that trust is there and they're more likely to, to listen to our messages. Our communications need to be authentic. They need to be positive. Let's not tell people about what will happen if they don't take the vaccine. Let's tell people about what will happen if they do take the vaccine. It's just changing that message on its, turning that message on its head. So it's about being more positive, talking about the benefits of the vaccine, protecting them, them their families, not about saying this is what, you know, you'll die, you're being selfish, etc. And we did hear those messages play out. Some of the things that I'm not going to talk too much about are things like mental health. This was a huge area that actually, I mean, I could talk all day about the, the issues that came out about mental health and why we see in um, our mental health hospitals that they are, they are filled disproportionately with people from ethnic minority backgrounds. They're, people from ethnic minority backgrounds are more likely to get sectioned to people from, from British people. And there are some genuine reasons behind that. Part of that is around the culture. Part of that is around services not being fit for purpose for um, uh, uh, in ethnic minorities. And part of that is because a lot of people from ethnic minorities are not understanding that the NHS provides services to support people with their mental health. Some people felt like it was they own, the NHS was just there for physical health. I think that's an important thing to take away. And lastly, the role of the GP being absolutely key to anything we do because people's trust around their GP was so high and I'm not even sure it even with with that GPs understood the level of influence and, and dare I say it power that they have with certain communities so taking all of that and going on to um, uh, the insight and I can see I'm running out of time so I'm gonna have to just skip through this really quickly we built um, nine place plans. So each local authority area, we built plans that would tell them how they re we refreshed who their who who um, their ethnic minority communities were. So we told them exactly who was in your who was living in your conurbation. Uh, we t we told them exactly what some of the barriers and the focus should be on the vaccine. So what are some of their key concerns? And we told them which postcodes they needed to target with any of their with any of their communication. So each of the nine local authorities we created these plans for. Um, we applied that insight into our campaign. We targeted eight ethnic minority groups that we knew that was the hesitant. We used the right messages to di direct them. We ensured there was maximum cut through using the right branding, using people that were authentic community leaders. We used the right media because we knew what media each uh, and what channels each of those groups were most likely to engage with. And we ensured that we used this tool to really pinpoint where the people were to ensure that we were very, very targeted. So here's here's just um, um, an example of how we executed it. Uh, this is Dr. Mahmoud. He was a community leader. We had, we used the NHS brand. We, we spoke directly to people from his community. 
another example of people from the Chinese community, what their concerns were. We use someone from the Chinese community, the black community. You can see that we just made, we, 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 we did everything we can to make sure that we had a range of messages using a range of protagonists, i.e. community leaders, etc. And we led a complete full marketing, a full marketing campaign, both offline, doing community engagement, etc., as well as off online. And we executed it strategically and in a very targeted way, always being led by our inside and by insight and data. Lastly, this is the important bit, and I feel like I should have spent a bit, uh, I should have made, uh, saved myself more time or uh, to say, talk to you about this. This saved lives. We know it saved lives. We saw, we saw our vaccination figures store. But the thing we know most, we, we know from our post campaign research that sentiment had changed. We could prove that there were differences in people who had seen some of our campaign. Those who had seen at least one execution of our campaign or messages were 21% more positive than those that hadn't about taking the vaccine. So we could see we changed sentiment. But the proof was in the pudding. Here is a chart that shows, shows just how in February, our vaccination rate with um, people with ethnic minorities was at about 0.66%. And by May, during that was our campaign period, it had rate, risen to 38.35%, a huge increase. Now, we know there was other factors that influenced that as well, but what we could see, we were an outlier in other areas, that our vaccination figures within ethnic minority communities rose substantially at a higher rate than anywhere else in a, in a neighbouring area, and that was because of the approach that we'd taken. So I'm going to this is my final slide and I'm going to laugh and I'm, I'm going to end this with. This thing about getting inside people's heads, why it's so important. So this is a bit of an anecdote from um, a story I heard once about a, a pub owner. I think it was in Wales and she had problems with, uh, for want of a better word, men not being able to aim straight. And what that led to was her toilets, her urinals in the in her men's toilets were always filthy. So she started putting up signs, asking people to just be a bit more mindful. She uh, she did she she tried so many things to get people to just be bit, bit, be a bit more conscious about keeping her urinals tidy. And then she was speaking to some of the men one night, and one of them made this joke about we only we only we, if we had something to aim at, then maybe we would um, we would we would aim straight, and that was a eureka moment. So she had little flies painted into um, her urinals, and after she did that, almost overnight she saw a remarkable increase in the cleanliness of her of her urinals and her toilets, because dare I say it. A man's mind works slightly differently. And actually, when you can get inside a person's mind, you're more likely to get the results that you want. Thank you. Now, oof, I feel like I've been talking for, well, 45 minutes. I have been. So these are my contact details. Please do get in touch. Please do, if um, I'm not as, uh, I'm not as, um, active as I can be on both of these channels but if more people contact me more people start liking me and engaging with me I it will force me to be and I'm just going to end this I know I'm, we're going to pass over to you to ask me some questions but I've just got one question I've got one poll one more poll that I'd like to ask people and I think Leslie are you getting that ready the poll just um the final poll to ask people I have a question for you um is it coming up great what is the main barrier stopping you from taking a social marketing approach while trying to target your audiences and customers? Now, as I said before, I've only I only had five options there, so please try and choose one of those five options. Um, the first one being none. Do you always follow a social marketing and insight-led approach already? Second one, is it time? Is it the time factor that stops you from following this type of approach? 
Is it the money factor? Is that why you don't follow a social marketing or insight led approach? And, I, and I'm assuming by the fact that we have at almost 500 people on this call that people are very interested in, um, in social marketing and following an insight led approach. But is it your knowledge and your experience that stops you from, from un, for following this approach? Or are you not convinced by it all? Was I not convincing enough? that actually following this type of approach will get you the results that you need. Now, as I say, I know I talked about it from a health perspective, but I'm really, really convinced that actually in any kind of sector, following a, an approach where you actually get into the minds of the people you're trying to target will get you the results that you need. So I think we are just waiting for the results to come up. Oh, and here we are. OK, great. Excellent one person who is still not convinced by it please or, or one percent so it's probably more than one person isn't it okay i'd love you to put in the chat why it is that you're not convinced but um what it seems like the reason why a majority of people are not following or, or or struggle to follow that approach is the money the resource which i completely appreciate and all of those factors but absolutely love the fact that 22 percent always follow a social marketing and insight-led approach that is brilliant that's me thank you very much i think that do we are uh, do we have time for some questions now um, yes i think we'll have time for a few um apologies we've overrun slightly um but as we mentioned earlier there will be a recording of this placed on our youtube channel later on so if anybody does have to leave because of another commitment you could always catch up with it later on um we'll try and take as many um questions as we can so thank you very much for the presentation edna um and i and i will also stress at this point we think we've had a technical issue with uploading the slides and um, there's a few of you asked questions about that but we will make those slides available to you either if we can get the problem solved now or we'll email them out to you later on so um don't worry everybody we'll get them to you if we can um so thank you again to edna we're now going to have a short q a session we've already got some good questions to get us underway um, which we'll get to in a second but please do continue to post your questions for edna by selecting the question mark icon we'll try to get through as many as we can um and obviously if you're on facebook or youtube if you want to take part in future q a's um you need to register and participate via the GoTo webinar app so um first question edna um what would you do differently if you were running your program again it's been very successful what would you do differently yeah that's an interesting one um uh, i think there's learning from every program that you run i think what i would probably do differently is what we found what we what we what we heard was the role of a gp being so key and how much people trusted gps I think I would work closer, close, more closely with GPs to support the actual rollout of some of the campaign, i.e. getting some of the campaign, some more of the GPs to voice some of the messages for us and to engage with the communities. But really importantly, I think I would bring the GPs in a bit more so they understood how important their role was because or is, because I'm not sure whether some of our um, healthcare professionals recognise just how much people value them, trust them, and how much influence they can have on certain behaviours. Okay, um, next question is um, someone saying that, obviously we're, we're about to, we're going back into another round of vaccines as um, we're approaching the winter for certain um, parts of the population. Um, can you see a change in attitude that's carried over into this? Or, or I've heard the word, um, um, you know, people are sort of all, they think it's not necessary anymore. Will there be a need for another campaign to make sure people do take up those offer of a booster? I think that's a really good question. And we are, we are in, we're about to go back into another um, vaccination campaign program. But this time around, we don't have the same level of backing from the government. And that's and that's just me being really honest. Um, the government aren't doing the same level of advertising and promoting the vaccine um, as they have in previous years. So it might be a challenge. I'm going to be honest, because people have got so used to living their lives. There are a lot of people who we know have already been vaccinated. So therefore feel like oh, I can't be bothered to be vaccinated again. So I think there's a little bit of a suck it and see. 
So we'll wait and see how we get where we get to in probably November and December and see why, whether there is more work that we we'll need to do. And I think what we'll probably find is, as usual, it's that certain groups that will are more hesitant and we'll need to do some work to actually encourage those hesitant groups to be vaccinated, I'm sure. Okay. Um, someone's asking a question about the team that you've referred to, a team of people that worked on this. How big was the team um, and what different roles were there within the team? So it wasn't a huge team, to be honest. I had a team of about four people. However, I didn't do all the work myself. So we, I worked alongside a really great marketing agency, an agency called Influential, who are based in Liverpool. And they supported with all three of those phases. So they worked with um, other agencies that would help kind of get the boots on the ground in terms of doing some of that engagement and some of the research. And we also worked with a data mining aid company that would do that pulled all the data together. So whilst I sort of refer to them as my team, I only had a small team in um, the NHS, but my extended team was the agency that I worked with that did everything from, did, did, they, they led on most of the research. Okay. Um, it was mentioned as well that there was obviously national research that was undertaken by the government in the UK and the NHS. Um, was there any concern that there could be incons inconsistencies um, from that national approach and, and other regional or um, different nations as well? We had different approaches across the, the UK nations as well. Did it lead to any inconsistencies um, in other parts of the country? The, the really interesting thing and I don't mean to blow my own trumpet, but I'm going to. Um, we started doing this work first. We started doing this research before the government started doing their research. So actually, I shared some of this research with people, um, some of our national colleagues. And our research, when they started doing their research, correlated completely with what they were finding. And it also correlated with vaccine uptake figures in terms of the groups that were more hesitant and the groups that were um, who were more rejectors. So I would still I would still encourage. So whilst there was that national research going on, have to remember that actually when you do things at a very local level, you can find out things and find out nuances and additional insight that you may not have been able to gather if you've done it on a national footprint. So some of the things that were very, very specific to some of our localities weren't picked up in the national research. So that's why I would always say, even if that national research was there, I might not have gone as um, started from the base that I started from, but I would still build on that research. And I would encourage people to do that anyway. So that's an interesting question. Did you have to use any incentives um, for the survey and completion of focus groups or anything like that to en encourage it? Or was it purely a um, research project on a higher level? So for, so, um, for the quantitative research, we didn't. That was all survey based and we didn't use any incentive for that. The qualitative research, like most research, you often do offer some kind of incentive. So I think that we offered about £20. Um, so this was for focus groups for sort of um, communities to uh, to, act, to attend focus group. I think we incentivised them by £20, £30, which is quite often very usual in that type of research but when we when we did the work this is this is the quality of work when we did the in-depth phone calls etc with community leaders and community representatives we didn't pay we didn't pay them anything right now we are we are running very short of time now so i'm going to wrap this up with a final question um which is combined from two two comments a couple of different people have asked about this they're obviously inspired by the idea of becoming social marketers um, and one person is saying, is there any, how can they best sort of um, train or learn or study um, alongside CIM training to be that? Or are there any books you can point them to? Obviously, there's the um, LinkedIn group for our charity and social marketing group at CIM. We would say that as a starting point. But have you got any advice for any aspiring social marketers? Oh, gosh, that's an interesting one, isn't it? Because at the time when I was starting to learn how to be a social marketer, there was that was it was a buzzword. And there was particularly in the NHS, there was lots of there was a centre, um, the National Centre of Social Marketing, which is which is now closed down. And there was lots of courses and lots of conferences. I don't think there is as much. But can I encourage whoever's asked that question to send me a message? Um, using the details I put up I don't know if we can go back a slide just to put my to put my um, contact details up again if we if you want to contact me I will then 
have a look and see whether there is anything that I would recommend um, that you that you that you read or courses that you attend. Okay, thank you very much, Edna. So unfortunately, I think we're we're out of time now. We could have gone on, like you say, we could have talked about this for hours because it's something that it, it's um, it, it impacts everybody <laughs> globally. Um, so it's very important work that you've done there. So congratulations on that. Um, unfortunately, that's all the time now we have for the Q and A. I'd like to say thank you once again to Edna for the fantastic presentation and to the CIM Charity and Social Marketing Group for organising the webinar. We do hope that you've enjoyed the session and found it interesting and worthwhile. Hopefully we'll get those slides to you as soon as possible. Um, we'll be also sending out a short survey in the next few hours and would love to hear your feedback. It will only take a few minutes and all the survey responses are anonymous. So please do let us know your thoughts and what you would like to see from our webinar express series in the future. We'll be back with our next Webinar Express session, which is Freedom of Thought in the Online World, on Tuesday, the 20th of October, at our usual time of 1 p.m. with our guest speaker, Susie Allegre, who will be sharing how the powerful big tech organizations have always sought to get inside our heads, influence how we think and shape and what we buy. You'll find further details listed on the events page of our website, where you'll also be able to register for the session. And this is the best way if you want to get involved with the Q&As and submit questions. So if you've been watching us via Facebook or YouTube today, remember to register for the session and then watch us via the GoToWebinar platform. So that just leaves me to say a final thank you to you for joining us today. And we hope that you've enjoyed the webinar. Take care, everyone, and we look forward to seeing you again soon.